Sometimes a show is more than a show. Sometimes a show is a connection to a, a person that somehow has something going on in their world uh, that radiates uh, positivity, energy, success, but success in a different way than is normal. And today we get to do that. Uh, this conversation with Louis Gagnon is uh, just just magic. And I am so grateful for the chance that uh, I had to talk to him and that you're going to have today to experience that conversation. Uh, Louis is, uh, has been a rock star for much of his life, has uh, led Monster.com, uh, Audible, a whole bunch of other really cool companies as uh, chief marketing officer, chief product officer, has built some really amazing things in his life. And today you get to hear his story and you get to learn about not just his story, but the wisdom that comes out of his story. And uh, I am so grateful that you get this chance to do that with me today. So buckle up. This is a good one. Louis Gagnon, welcome to the Advisory Board Insider Podcast. I am really glad you're here. Thank you, Tom. I'm really glad to be here too. So where are you located in the world right now? I am about 10 miles from Manhattan in a beautiful town on the Jersey side called Montclair. Got it. All right. And um, what was your morning drink of choice this morning or what's your typical morning drink of choice? Water with lemon, my friend. Water with lemon. And is that, uh, is there a health reason for that? Is there a, what, what's the reason behind that? The lemon part is supposed to be cleansing. And okay. so uh, I have a, a very kind of regimented routine in the morning. And I start with that cleansing um, so that my stomach is ready for the breakfast that I will have after my regiment, if you like. And, and so in your morning regimen, which is real, sounds really, um, um, very well defined, what else happens in your morning? Like as you get up on an average normal day, what's your morning regimen look like? Yeah. So, um, I try to sleep well, which is at least eight hours. Yeah. Um, then I have a full glass of water. I do some yoga exercise, stretching just to, um, uh, activate my spine just so that mm -hmm. all of my nervous terminations are kind of ready to fire up. Uh, then I go play pickleball. I play like most of us. <laughs> I don't know if you're in that bandwagon yet, but uh, there's a lot of Americans playing pickleball. There are, yes. And so I play a couple hours and I come back and then I do breathing uh, exercises and then I do meditation. And then I have quick breakfast and I'm ready to have the most beautiful day. Wow. Well, that's really cool. So thank you for sharing that because it gives me a sense a little bit more of who you are. But uh, I want you to rewind. And uh, I get the sense that you and I are roughly the same age because I did some digging. And I don't know you other than this conversation, the first time we've talked. So uh, I went and did some digging. And I, I get the sense that in 1983, 1984, you were in Quebec City. Correct. So give me a sense at that age, what are you dreaming about? What are you thinking about? What's this future look like that's unfolding in front of you as you enter the, the, the last years of high school? Yes. Um, hockey, as any good Quebecer, is front and center in my life. I'm playing it. And I am thinking at that time, well, you know, I'm a good player. Maybe, maybe I could play go to college and play hockey. Maybe I could even get drafted. Uh, that was the dream. Uh, and, uh, besides there was obviously, uh, professional aspirations, very, very generally defined as I want to understand the world and I want to be able to impact it in some ways, very broad at that stage. So I read somewhere, because I went digging even deeper than your LinkedIn profile, I read somewhere or I heard somewhere that you worked as a part-time orderly at a psychiatric hospital. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, 
there was a huge institution about five minutes from uh, my parents' place. And I had an aunt who had been um, a patient in there since the age of three. She was blind, got a surgery, and they touched a nerve to her brain. And um, she stayed at the mental age of three or four. And so I got exposed to the institution, uh, mm. you know, like the cuckoo's nest that uh, yeah. famous movie showed us. I saw that uh, very early and was fascinated uh, by the whole scene um, and how one ended up there. And so when I was 18, the first thing I wanted was to be part of this. Hmm. I don't know if you remember, 1884, uh, 1984, Quebec City uh, was welcoming the tall boats. Um, and uh, this was supposed to be a huge event. And so they recruited 10 students who work in a department that would be dedicated to welcoming the people who would come to the event and kind of uh, lose their balance, which is something that happened at any big international events. So right. I started doing that that summer and uh, stayed in the institution for four or five years throughout my uh, undergrad and did absolutely everything uh, that one can do. And orderly to this day remains one of the most beautiful, satisfying job I have ever had. So why is that? What causes it to be beautiful? Instant gratification in helping making a difference in someone's day. Uh, I really cared about the 40 people in my department. So I was never in the nurse post talking to the staff. I was on the floor rocking with the patient and mm. hearing their stories and trying to give them something, trying to just listen to their stories of the day. I had some, so many amazing stories I heard over the years. Uh, one patient, was constantly scheming of going out of the hospital and evading the hospital. And I accompanied her planning exercise for at least two years, every day. And every day I would just listen and not deny her the dream of coming out, but just right. play along. And so that is the sort of satisfaction one gets when one sees that one is being listened and being happy to just being listened to. Uh, and so it's just like giving joy and, and happiness as much as you can on a daily basis is pretty rare. And, and yet there's something to me that's intriguing about your, your spirit because your aunt, you said was in there, but there's something because so many people see the other and feel a level of disconnect. Yes. Right. And they, they kind of avoid that otherness of someone who. Uh, has has mental or emotional challenges. We kind of avoid them. Yeah. Uh, you te you tended to run into them, like you you tended to. So what what was inside of you that was causing that desire to connect with that um, with those very special people? Yeah. Like what what was different there for you than the average eighteen year old who's you know playing hockey on yeah. weekends? Look, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to make a generalization about others as much as I will say what I felt. Uh, yeah. I don't feel qualified to make that judgment, but I felt that I was no different. Mm. I felt that I was one with them. I felt that whatever had happened to them that led them here could have happened to me. Right. Why? Because I had an aunt who was in there. Right. I, I yeah. mean, there was very clear the deduction, the implication of that to me was, look how lucky you are, man. Yeah. And yet, so you're, you're doing this and then you're going through your undergrad and your undergrad appears to be in business, international affairs, and then you do a master's of science in marketing. So there seems to be a big disc. Well, I mean, it's all connected in your, your world, but from me sitting from the outside, here's somebody who's, who's involved in an as an orderly in a psychiatric hospital. And yet on this, it's sort of your, your focus is marketing and business and international affairs, which is such a unique combination. I'm, I'm deeply intrigued what the decision process was to go that direction. Yeah. It's fascinating how we get to things. Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to be a philosopher. And, ah. and my <laughs> dad told me, look, buddy, <laughs> try and find something that's going to bring some food on your table because <laughs> I'm done by the time you're 18. And so um, I, I considered the following. I said, well, if I cannot understand the nature of the world, maybe I can understand how it works. Mm. And maybe I can actually be an actor in it. And that's the business path. Um, so from orderly to business school is that. And then as an orderly, 1988 is the time of the deinstitutionalization movement. We're taking those people and the institution, putting them out in the streets right. and different resources. There's a big corpus of knowledge and studies that's happening at that time. 18 uh, PhDs at my hospital alone trying to structure that thing. And as an orderly, I'm talking to patients and I ask them, why are you going to come out? And they say, I'm going to have more cigarettes, more sex, and more freedom. I was like, okay, so that, is that what they told you? I said, no, they're not telling me much. Then I go in the community and I ask my neighbors, would you, would you mind if we had like a bunch of People from there in here, and absolutely no way ever. And then I talked to the 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 employees and realized that they had no clue either. So I went to the president of the hospital and I said, "Sir, you have a major problem. Nobody wants this thing to happen, and you need to understand the motivations a little more." And I had marketing one uh, one hundred one under my belt. <laughs> and he said, look, kid, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do focus group and I want to do surveys. And I really want to understand what's happening and make some recommendation. And he said, yes, only if you can work with the 18 PhDs I have. I said, sure, let me take their permission. I'll work with them. They all said yes, except one. At the end of my study, which was amazing, um, the president was asking for $70 million of extra resources to do interventions in the community to sell this thing. It's the beginning of social marketing to sell this thing to the world. And the, that PhD who said no called me to tell me about the beta error that I had carried throughout my experimental device. I had no idea what he was talking about. And that day I said to myself, never again. I'm going to go get the tools and the technical knowledge so that I have the technical means to do what I want to do. And that was my master's in science. Ah, uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so you've got a mass, you've got a business degree, you've got an international affairs degree, and then a master's of science in marketing, and then you go overseas. Yeah. Like you head overseas. So I read you started in, um, where did you start? Rwanda, I think you started. Rwanda. So, you know, in life, it's interesting how uh, people identify what you want and who you are early on, and they send opportunities to you. Um, and if you're well intended, it's going to come. And so uh, I wanted to do the international thing, and I had a track record. I've been selected to write a book in Taiwan and to go work in New York at my grad school. And coming out, same teacher who given me some of those opportunities says, you know, I have heard of a, an organization called Population Services International. They're doing social marketing, which you did at the psychiatric hospital, but they're doing it for the AIDS pandemic. And they're mm. globally. And the AIDS pandemic is a, the issue of the time. And right. I'm like, okay, I'm interviewing with the McKinsey at the time. And I'm like, Am I going to be a, a junior there or am I going to go there, do things? And I right. decided that I would go do things. So I took a job in uh, $40,000 of traveler's checks and my money bill to go launch a program that was unfunded, that I needed to deal a contract from another organization to get funded. And um, long story short, Two years later, we saved 15,000 lives, um, had a huge impact, and uh, I became sort of a well-known quantity in the development world 
yeah. apply those business techniques techniques to a social cause. And so I went to London and got hired to do the same thing, but this time with European dollars as opposed to American dollars. And I did that in another eight countries. And so, uh, in total, we basically were commercializing condoms, communications, distribution, brand, local brand, local relevance, education, and all of this using modern techniques, but we would sell the condoms at a very, very low price and get the UN and the big funding institutions to subsidize the price. And, um, so I became an expert at that. And, um, that was the first chapters from Rwanda to Europe. And then in Europe, uh, I'm analyzing everything that's happening in social marketing. I have a keen analytical eye and I realized that it's not working. Even if we are the best means to propagate that AIDS prevention, um, we're a drop in the bucket. Right? Mm. There is no mass diffusion. It saturates after so many years because we don't have what's called in marketing, the word of mouth effect. Right. Right. Usually if I see you when I liked you and I liked your glasses, I'm going to say next time I look for glasses, Hey, Tom had those glasses. I'm going to do the same thing. If I don't do that normally, you may even talk to me and tell me, did you see my glass look at that? that, that you. So that's word of mouth. Yeah. With condoms, none of this, I don't see right. you wearing it. Then you're not going to talk to me. So marketing is very good at getting the innovators, but then the early majority uh, is not picking up because the innovators are not doing the word of mouth job. Mm. So I invented the technology that could track and pay for the economic effect of simple word of mouth. Hmm. I went to India then and implemented the pilot project. Uh, funded by the international aid community and, um, had a huge success. Um, and that led me to do the same thing on the internet when the internet started to pick up. Um, and then I became an internet entrepreneur back to Montreal, trying to do word of mouth marketing on the web for telco and credit card companies. And so that's the U Y O U G E company. Yeah, I'm guessing you make it huge was the the tagline, uh, and um, I did not know as a good French Canadian that you make it huge that huge Y O U G E would not be decoded by the English mind as huge huge would be decoded as U G. But so I had a problem <laughs> with that, bro. That's funny. Before we go into where you went, because there, there's a couple of things to stand out. I, I kind of looked at the timing on your time in Rwanda, and I know that that's during the genocide, isn't it? Yes. And so tell me a little bit about your, your, your trying to um, uh, deal with and push, it sounds like, the AIDS epidemic, but at the same time, you're face-to-face -face with a genocide epidemic. I mean, not even epidemic, just horrific yeah. something to, Tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Yes. Um, I could tell you about that experience for a long time and there could be a lot of tears involved. I bet. This was the trauma of my life. Really? So I seriously traumatized out of this experience. Oh. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, I had to deal with my own staff dying from AIDS, right? 37% of the population was HIV positive. There was no cocktails at the time. You just oh, like, you die. Goodness. So, so death was very, very prevalent around me. And then there was a civil war leading to the genocide where there was no state of law. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, shootings and all sorts of very, very, very cruel uh, things happening, leading to a million people being killed within three months. We were evacuated before the whole thing unfolded at the beginning of it. Um, but uh, I have seen uh, things that I, I, I wish I had never seen, and I have felt yeah. things I wish I had never felt. Um, yeah. I knew General Dallaire, who was fellow Canadian, leading the UN uh, 
groups efforts there. And, um, I, what I've gone through is like a very, very, very small, tiny proportion of what he's gone through. So I don't want to make my thing, um, as big as that, but it was enough for me to certainly carry a serious scar for the rest of my life. I bet. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I, I don't want to probe on it, but I realized as I, as I, I, I review that there was this, this, this connection point there that seems really profound. Yeah. So, um, I, I read somewhere that you say learning cycles always start with ease and then challenges come soon after. Yeah. So, uh, let, let's, uh, you, you've built this company now you're back in Montreal and you're building this technology company at the start of the internet. Give me a sense of the ease and then the challenges that hit with that business. Yeah. Uh, we, I raised $500,000 from friends and family and, uh, we launched and we have like a, a big tech deal with CGI and a big, uh, accounting uh, deal with KPMG that, you know, stamps our rewards and it's a big operation. We're building it for global impact. And uh, six months in, we got an offer from a telco um, to uh, be bought at $80 million. Um, so six months later, 80 million. Ouch. Um, we launched on some some, I don't even know what to say to that because I, I want to dig in on that one because because <laughs> there's some really cool stuff that happens in six months to go from half a million in funding to six billion, did you say? Six, no, 80 million. 80 million. Oh, sorry. I don't know where my six came from. 80 million. Wow. So it's six okay. months. Six, six months, right. Got it. Wow. Okay. And so um, this was the time, a time where people dreamt big, like, yeah, the thing was exploding, like everything was possible. And we were part of that everything's possible thing. And we, we had a fundamental insight. Uh, we were expert in word of mouth. We were expert in sharing and sharing had never been made so easy. We could now track it with like right. electronic means. We could track transactions by electronic means. So we could be very sophisticated in how you enable and reward word of mouth. Um, so that excited that big company and, uh, then the dot com crash arrived. And so I got my term sheet a week before the crash and it got canceled a week after the crash. Oh, <laughs> oh, so the 80 million never came to fruition. Like, no. <laughs> oh, that was a beautiful setup because wow. <laughs> So did the whole, what, what happened? Like, what was the, I guess, what's the challenge that became the lesson or what did you learn in that whole? Well, in that time, it's the importance of the external environment. I, I totally put my eggs in that basket. There was a deal that was happening and I never had a plan B. Mm. And so, uh, we did not fund them beyond the 500,000 and when the, they'll, they'll through, I got found myself in a position where I had to tell the staff, what do you want to do? We fire mm -hmm. half of you or we cut our salaries by half. And, um, mm -hmm. they all chose the latter, which made me feel very good. Uh, and we went on for six months, half paid until we could fund again. And, uh, and then other cycles of it's easy and, and it's not really happening the way you want four or five of them followed, um, and the company never did what I wanted it to do. Mm. You know, I came from a, a, an idealistic kind of perspective, trying to change the world. And, uh, that to me was a way to redistribute money to people from the marketing industrial complex. Uh, that mm. was my goal. And I had a, an idea that credit card companies were my ideal partners. Uh, and I signed two of them and, uh, credit cards at the time were very complex machines with high turnover and very conservative in so many ways. And on the, um, by the time the lawyers and the teams, uh, implemented 
my technology. It took a year and a half, two years. And by that time, it had been so diluted that mm. it was not going to do what it was meant to do. And that is when I decided, okay, I maybe need to look for something else. And so monster.com shows up. Monster.com shows up. So from uh, what I read, 2004 to 2010, you go on this big adventure with Monster. Yes. Starts with the Canadian uh, operations. At the time, it's $10 million. Uh, fairly small. I take product and marketing. Uh, I work extremely well with the GM and the sales guy, and we build amazing results up to 65 million in, within a couple of years. Uh, and all of that because we decided to become data driven and to, mm. to build viral applications that were data driven. Uh, I became marketer of the year in Canada, uh, top CMO in the North America, uh, a lot because of applications that we developed as part of that. I won't get into the details, but we had something called rate your boss where, um, there was nine statements about your boss and you would basically, uh, rate your boss and, um, we could tell you if your boss was better than the average for your job category and your region. And we could allow you to recognize your boss. And on the other side, we would contact the boss and recognize them in the newspaper locally radio when we would give them uh, job post things and it was like an integrated marketing effort that was very very data driven yeah and so that really uh took me uh, like casted me as a typo and within the organization and i became head of global product uh in the years that ensued and really got to grow uh, a couple billion dollars worth of business um within years and this was quite the right. So uh, let's let's jump back there, and it's maybe 2000, and you're, you ended that run in 2010, but what were the big mo monster lessons you got from that six-year period? What were the things that have never left you that just were so integral to the learning? So I will start with the same lesson I got at huge, which is, Watch out for the environment, man, because when mm. 2008 happened, we lost half of our revenue overnight. So 800 million just disappeared. Really? Yeah. Because mm. in the crisis, the middle of the crisis, nobody wants to hire. Right. Like then, so um, did not see that one coming. <laughs> I uh, right. Other than yeah. that, um, you know, I've learned that, uh, growing, uh, organically, uh, is certainly less messy than growing by acquisition. I had to carry the can of cleaning up 35 acquisitions globally, 55 countries and build one platform to unit oh. everything. We did that in nine months. It was a big project called Redux. And so. I've seen how uh, growth by acquisition could be costly. Uh, there is a huge cost to it. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, you focus on the revenue side, but you don't know what cost uh, is waiting for you to, to come. And so that, that's another big lesson. And then lessons about leadership. Right. right. Uh, Monster had leadership uh, uh, changes to do with option scandal and wall street and and the whole internet culture became enmeshed with the wall street culture and that has created a bunch of issues and i got to see how you go from being an internet culture to being a, a wall street culture oh, pros bet. and cons of each and yeah. that sort of thing so from there you go to yodel which is a high performing marketing company Correct. I mean, right. It's like a agency. It's like a internet marketing agency. Correct. But, uh, their goal is to, uh, they're a tech firm first and foremost, and they are, uh, doing SCN and SEO and automation of everything, marketing for the small business to get them out of the yellow page business. So we're in 2008, the market has crashed and the SMBs 
is the future. And so I convinced myself that I should be helping the SMBs at that time. At that time. And Yodel had an amazing team, an amazing product. And uh, I joined them as, again, CPMO, product and marketing. And uh, we had another amazing ride from 40 million to 200 within three, four years. Um, and uh, this time, it was just such a pleasure uh, mm. Do given the quality of people, I've never seen such a high performing team. Um, it was just a pleasure to do this with those people. Now, I seem to recall that you got awards for that time frame too. Like there were some awards that came because just the, the sheer incredible growth that happened at Yodel. Yes. Uh, we got, you know, on the list of, uh, Fortunate Inc. 500 uh, every year, and we were the best in every the best startup in New York, and the best of this, the best of that. Yeah. Uh, I was I was honored by Google as a Google partner. We developed a technology that was outperforming Google's own algorithm at delivering ROI for the SMB uh, on the SCM front. We were building intelligence on top of Google to make sure that the dentist had more clicks and more calls than using AdWords on its own. And so we, we, we got recognized for that and had a, an amazing, amazing time. And then, you know, let, let's not, let, let's not actually diminish the companies you're going. Now you go to Audible, <laughs> <laughs> um, which to me, as I look at it and I go back in my own history um, and watch my Audible I feel like I got crazy about Audible when you were there. So thank you, because I'm a massive Audible fan. Um, so some amazing thing happened. You get hired by uh, Amazon. Uh, well, no, Audible was uh, was not Amazon at the time, or were they? It was Amazon. It was. Okay. The CEO calls me, well, got recruited. And the CEO says, uh, look, the company has not been growing to a pace that satisfies Jeff. Uh Jeff loves the audiobook category. He's a very literary person. Yeah. He was a, the, the writer. So there was like a, a very serious love of Audible within the Amazon uh, empire. So I'm being asked to take growth from a profile of 15 to 20% to 40 to 50. And if I do that, I would be king. And so I said, sure, let's go. <laughs> At that time, I feel like, you know, there's no, no challenge I cannot take. Right. Then I realized how lucky I've been. Mm. Because mobile was exploding at that time. Right. And so integrating ourselves into the Amazon system and riding the mobile way allowed us to grow 50 to 60% per year the following years and then diversifying the brand from being an audio book company to being more of a media company. Uh, we were teaching English to kids in, uh, in Japan. Uh, we were uh, launching an enterprise product for salespeople to train themselves in their cars. Uh, uh, we had a bunch of very, very exciting projects, uh, on the docket. So in that time frame where the world is essentially your oyster, like you're, you're a rock star, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, if you're running audible and you're growing at 50%, you've become a rock star. Yeah. So are you aware at that point in your own life of any cracks in the system of your own system, or is it just such an amazing ride that you can just ride this wave? Um, you're, you're king of the world. You're really making things happen, but is there any, as, like, is there any sense in you that uh, um, I'm doing really well here, but over here I'm crumbling? Is there any of that? Because you you spoke about you know Rwanda and the and the deep scar tissue of that. And you've you've had these moments where it was all working, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. Um, is there anything going on at that time frame of interest? What a great question, Tom. Very very good question. Yes, there was, mm -hmm. and. Um, so one day I'm coming out of a building and someone reporting five levels below me comes and says, can I talk to you? I've never done what I'm going to do. Please don't judge me if I'm wrong, but something I got to tell you, come on, tell me. 
and he says, um, I'm a devotee of an Indian yogi and he's go coming to the Blue Ridge Mountain in North Carolina. And I'm here to tell you to come and you should come with your daughter. I'm like, what? Like, yoga? Me? What? My daughter? Hmm, that's weird. Because my daughter was struggling at that time. She was 10 and she had mental health mental health issues with depression. I was like, this is too weird. I'm going to go. Wow. And, and so I show up with my daughter and I'm in the middle of a big hall and hundreds of people meditating. And I sit on a cushion and I imitate what the master was doing. And I realized in that moment, what the crack was for me. And the crack was that I never felt that it was enough. Mm. I might have been the king of the world, but I felt like the servant and I felt like I was never going to be enough. And oh, Jeff was so much larger and this was so much richer. And, and I was in that sphere where people were amazing. I, I got to, you know, interact with the richest king of my time. And so I definitely had experiences of people bigger than me. And, um, and it got me to realize that I wasn't to a, an infinite chase. Mm. And in that moment, my butt on that cushion in me, not outside of me, I realized that I am just perfect the way that I am. Mm. Oh, powerful, powerful. Life changing. Yeah. And so that, that sense in you that allows you to then get okay with the fact that wherever you are is where you are. Yes. Uh, uh, well, how does that then translate back into the world of, of high pressure, high stakes, um, success at all costs, whatever that looks like. Cause I, I've never been in the shoes you were wearing, yes. but my gosh, I can only Im imagine the sheer volume of pressure that's on you every day to perform to quarterly earnings reports, whatever those are, those just, they, they'll come at you. Yes, they do. Um, and so before that moment, they put me in a fight flight state. Hmm. Before that moment, I would just like go and crunch the number and get the team to do even more in order to do this and that. And, and I was super stressed and I was, uh, shorter temper, uh, yeah. shorter temper. Uh, I definitely was not, uh, relaxed and I was not as good a father and as good a friend and as good a husband as a result. Yeah. Realizing that I was not bad, that I had never been bad. This was just like being lent to me for, for a second. And, uh, it was having some good material impact, but it was not me and it wasn't going to define me, allowed me to start investing in me mm. and not just what I was asked. And I realized that by having that centeredness, I was a more effective leader. I was um, even more impactful. Things were happening without me asking for it. My intuition, my creativity, my collaboration, my attractiveness as a human was just multiplied. And so a huge lesson. Up until then in my life, I had invested everything in external knowledge. Thinking if I understand the world, I'll be better for it. And at that moment, I start investing in my inner knowledge, realizing yeah. that, well, wait a minute, there is ROI in that knowledge too. That ROI is a multiple of any other trivia that I can find on the external world. Understanding who I am, understanding what is happiness, what's an emotion, what's the brain, what's the nervous system, how is this all connected, why do I feel, what is reality, all of these things, major, major, major transformation for me. And so I became much more effective with that. Yeah. 
So it sounds to me interesting that it took you a lot of years to get your philosophy degree. Yeah. Because <laughs> all those all those statements you just made are like your degree in philosophy. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Yeah. It makes like this, this full circle comes back and now you're, the stuff you're studying is really, uh, but it's internal. It's not just, it's not just. Um, intellectual. It's not just an intellectual exercise. Yes. And uh, you're actually living out your philosophy and you're learning it and experiencing it and bringing it back into the world that you inhabit. Yeah. Uh, that, that I, I, that's fascinating to me. Uh, so then, then from there uh, you, you do an amazing run at audible and then uh, you're known by TPG, which is a big, uh, like a private equity firm that buys companies. Right. And yes. you get brought into, I think it was ride.com or something like that. And you got to fix that thing up. Yeah. So uh, ride is a carpooling technology co-founder of Uber, Bono, Ashton Kushner and TPG invested a serious amount of money to make that happen. They were on the Uber high. They wanted yep. to do that uh, piece of it. It had not been working. It was a turnaround situation. Uh, and so uh, it was hard, uh, not easy uh, at all. And uh, I was able to uh, turn it around, sell it, uh, and it never really was going to do what they thought or what I thought it should do. Mm. And so, uh, we sold it and, uh, and then I became a TPG advisor. What happens usually is they give you another opportunity in the portfolio. And then I realized that I'm an entrepreneur. Everything that comes to me is like, yeah, uh, a restaurant software automation, it's not sexy. You know, I, I had a very intense human rich and, and all the businesses they were invested in felt too standard for me. And so I decided that I would just, uh, get out of TPG and do something else. And, um, I said to myself, I'm 50. I just experienced something amazing. Why don't I build something to help people have the same benefit I've had in life? Um, so I, the, the day I make that decision, um, I get a call from a billionaire in Australia who had invested in a neuroscience company and it was going nowhere, public company, but it was going to be a restart and the neuroscience part of it, I fell in love with because it would, I would use that as my entry point into the practices and into the conversations about you and some sort of measurement of before, after, so that you could really understand you, uh, self-awareness and, and, and practice. So that was the genesis of total brain, another five year of chapter, uh, trying to, uh, get people to help themselves with objective data um, and COVID hits and COVID hits and COVID not just hits the world, it hits you. So <laughs> tell me about your experience of COVID. Um, I was floored for 15 days in December, 2020. Um, my wife was into it. She's a nurse, uh, in charge of 11 mm -hmm. emergency rooms. So our lives was very affected by the whole thing. So I get really sick, um, go through it. And then we go our yearly, uh, annual holiday to Maui and we're in February and I'm in the plane and I'm feeling like pain in my legs. I'm like, is it pickleball? I like pulled another freaking muscle. I do that all the time. And so I get to Maui and. I go for runs and weeks later, a week later, I am at the hospital, uh, with multiple pulmonary embolies, oh. embolisms, uh, both lungs. Uh, and, uh, I had 50% chance of dying. Um, uh, they, uh, misdiagnosed me as being still having COVID, which meant I would go die alone, which had another set of, 
oh. layer of cuts for me. And so long story short is I, I decided to fight it back and live and, and I did. And four months later, I got that again. Uh, same scenario, even higher chance of dying. And, uh, they realized at that point that, um, I had gotten, uh, triggered by COVID, um, for an mm. a, a, a immune system disorder that made my blood clot in a, a irregular manner. And so I needed to now treat that just by being on blood thinner wasn't hard, but, uh, you can imagine that my year 2021 was a very a rough deep. year. Yeah. <laughs> very so, so, but, but something, I, it, it sounds to me like you're facing your imminent death. Yes. You're, you're very aware of your mortality. Um, you're in this space of being a, 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 a I think, managing director and CEO of Total Brain. Yes. Uh, and something, uh, obviously you're a philosopher. So what's going on? Like so you're hitting a wall here. Yes. I'm hitting the wall and, uh, and I have to understand why. Um, and I have someone who I really love and respect who tells me, you know, we, there's always a spiritual reason for everything. Your body, your soul, and your mind is one. It's integrated. And so yep. your soul knows something about what's happening to oh. you. That you need to know, go ask your soul, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you there? Why have you allowed this to be? So I take that advice and I meditate a lot on that. And in my meditation, beautiful back, I realized that in Rwanda, uh, I had felt abandoned, abandoned mm. by God, abandoned by the world. And in that moment, made the generalization that if I don't do it, nobody will. So I'm going to save that person because if I don't do it, there's no God. Like, forget it. For the rest of my life, I took everything on my shoulders. Mm. And I kept that mentality that, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. I, I, I'll carry the load. It's okay. You want to save that cup for me? I'll take it uh, because yeah. I believe in it. And so um, what my body was telling me at that time was, no, you're not the doer. Stop. You're not that all-powerful entity. There is a God and it's not you. And so, oh. <laughs> you got to chill, oh, man. So it's like the the um, manifestation of this physical illness is a direct result of you carrying these massive loads. Yes. That you are alone are the only one who can do it. Correct. Yeah. Oh, wow. So then it means what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And then the only rational out I have is I need to let go and I need to do something else. I need to rest. Right. Um, I, yes. I, I'd had like 30 years of go, 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 go. And my body was saying, take some time, chill. Um, and, and what I realized in the process was because, you know, people like us were like very purpose driven or what's my purpose and what am I going to oh. do next? And, and my conclusion was there was just one thing to oh. do, which is be joyful. Mm. Find freaking joy. Find joy. That's it. Yeah. And when you have so, that, you can think about something. So you rest, you go into rest mode. You, yes. you, uh, exit, uh, you exit the world of, of total brain, which is an Australian company. So, um, that, that to me already sounds complicated living in New York yeah. or close to New York and running that. With the headquarters you're, you're... in San Francisco. Oh, wow. 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 So. The, these, this, this story to me is profound and, and I'd like to, I'd like to take a detour, which is actually the whole purpose of the show, which is advisory boards and then come back if you're okay with yeah. that. Are you, are you okay with time? Cause I, well, we could talk for four hours and I'd be happy, but, um, I, I don't want to overdo it, but at the same time, I want to take a little diversion into advisory boards based on all this history and then come back into what the rest came, what came out of the rest. Yes. Um, so. 
through all these experiences, starting right back with your international work um, through um, your startup, through Monster, all of these, um, what and how did you personally engage advisory boards in that world that you were a part of? What did you see? What were some of the models you employed? What 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 did you experience from that perspective, this this counsel that you could get? You know, I'm going to tell you uh, something that will make your smile, I'm sure. As a good old North American, I had no idea what uh, an advisory board was. For me, there were pretty pictures to put on my PowerPoint to impress my investors. Ah. Of course, I would ask for advice and use them at the beginning, you know, once a month. And until you feel like they've given you everything they're going to give you, the five people they knew that could help you, they've given to you already. And now you gave them, you know, 0.2% uh, of the company and you, you go on to managing the company and the board and your staff and the suppliers. And there's no time to manage the, the advisor for me. Mm. So I completely misunderstood what was the, the power of an advisory board and how an advisory board can be focused on one issue and then rotate mm. and how that issue should be managed and how performance of advisor could be managed and how this whole thing is organic and should be constantly aligned and realigned with the CEO. The CEO who this time around is going to have a friend because as a CEO, your board, your board's not your friend. Right. They're your investors most of the right. time. And when you see problems, when you, you know, we all see problems. Sometimes we don't have the solution yet to have a space where I can find the solution before I talk to my board about the problem is super precious. And so the. What I realized was I did not know how to leverage it. And now I know that there is a role called an advisory board chair that can do this for me with someone like me who's been places, who's gone through the pain, who's gone through the loneliness of being a CEO, who can understand what I'm going through and align the best minds for my particular issue. And that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's that, that, that interesting model that, that uh, I never knew either. And so it sounds like you were, uh, despite being in this big, really, um, growing intense, um, front of the, the line kind of a, a action that was transpiring in all of the companies you were in, uh, that was just, it was more just like you said, the, uh, the people on the website that were advisors who got their cut because they were the right names yes. more than they provided something to you, uh, as a, as a major thinking process with you. Correct. It was, yeah. uh, I leveraged them for their network. I leveraged yeah. them for their expertise yeah. sometimes, but there was no renewal. This was a, a one shot deal. And, uh. I had no idea that it could be different. Yeah. So if you, it, cause I know you have and uh, continue to sit on advisory boards, what, what's the unique, um, cause we've heard your story now. And to me, the story is un, un, unbelievably cool, but when you sit on an advisory board, there's, there's a, it's like you see in a certain way. And so when you sit on an advisory board, what do you feel like you bring to that, that table? I bring that experience. Yeah. Right. I bring the going to the edge. I bring the never knowing what I'm doing yeah. and the process that comes with that, which is the process that CEOs need to come to go through all the time. You never know what you're doing really. So you need right. to learn quickly, uh, to know how to learn, to know where to look, to know where to disappear the right, uh, data points and let go of, of the, the noise is super important. So I bring that, yeah. uh, and I bring the experience of actually doing right. the startup phase, the yeah. growth phase and the big company phase on four continents. I've seen it. Yeah. So, um, I'm not saying that this is the be all end all, but it's definitely, uh, something fairly unique, uh, that, you know, if someone is interested in. Uh, having a serious growth 
I know how to do it. Yeah. You, you had the, uh, the opportunity recently to explore the whole advisory board center model, um, that, uh, that is something that for us in North America is somewhat new. I mean, I, I experienced it too, and that's how you and I connected, but, um, what, what, additional layers of that advisory board center model methodology structure really appealed to you? I love the idea of uh, creating an entity that is centered on the governance of the company, where there is governance rules uh, um, that make it a quasi governance tool. You're not there to comply with the rules, generally speaking, and you're not there to make decisions, but if you're going to solve issues, let's agree on what those issues are. Let's define who does what. Let's have a charger. Let's structure our approach the same way that we would do with investors. Right. right. And let's be accountable. Yeah. I and mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So if you could go back and give your younger self advice, say, as you started monster at monster, or you were, you had grown and you got sort of global, that global position or at audible, what advice would you give yourself now about advisory boards that you wish you had had back then? What, what would you say to yourself? I would say, uh, get yourself a chair, uh, and your chair is going to become your best friend. So like him up front because we're going <laughs> to spend a lot of time with him. Uh, so find that precious resource that is complementary to you. You know, in business, you always have like the founder business tech and so whoever you are, find the other side, uh, and find someone who is resourceful enough, um, to go outside of himself, to bring the right people, uh, that is connected, that has experience and. And just trust, trust the process because you will not have the time to manage it properly unless you have a chair is my experience. And so finding that chair would be the best advice I would give myself. Sweet. So let's, uh, bring the, uh, bring the, uh, bring the thing back around. So there's the whole, the, the advisory board experience, but. Uh, you take a rest from total brain and the rest leads you into some type of regenerative concept that starts to emerge for you. Tell me about your, the concept of regeneration and what that means and what that's taking, what journey is that taking you on now? Yes. So uh, part of my rest was to write a book. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not really going to hit the couch. And so I'm writing a, a book on existentialism. I am answering five existential questions. The philosopher is back, uh, trying to synthesize everything I've, I've known and learned over 56, 57 years. And part of that was to really understand the state of the world. And I'd never really taken the time to understand the whole climate thing and the whole extinction thing and Anthropocene thing. And, and as I'm Getting deep in there, I realize, okay, do we, there is not a lot of runway. Mm. We have a system that doesn't work, that has subsystems that don't work. Um, and, uh, clearly we are hitting the wall in so many ways. Uh, and you need to have a, a serious, um, devotion of your time to try and help because you cannot just read and and play pickleball. And so, um, I decided that I would do stuff that would help companies that are regenerative, defined by companies, which global impact is that they give more to life than they take. Hmm. Very broadly defined, but yeah. net net. Are you making a positive difference for this planet or are you taking from this planet? And if you're taking from this planet, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to those guys who are giving to the planet and I want to be their best friend. I want to help them and I want to resource them and I want to do everything I can 
to regenerate while it's done. And so the regenerative group, which is what your current organization is called or company, yes. um, is really doing that. So the vision is to help people who give more than they take. And so are you finding any lanes with that? Let's call them lanes. Uh, I, I read on that website, there's, there's a whole concept called addressing failed beliefs and projects addressing failed systems or projects addressing failed beliefs and projects addressing failed system. What's the distinction there? And can you give me a brief understanding of that distinction? Yes. Uh, I live in Montclair. The schools are hundreds, a hundred years old. They're all falling apart. And for the last 10 years, the board of heads cannot get budgets to renovate the schools because the mayor has been elected on the promise of not raising taxes. We are already one of the most taxed entity in the country. Right. Uh, as a result, the schools are falling apart literally. And so that's a system that is failing our kids and our future. Mm. We found a way to uh, get the board of education into uh, a, the referendum business where we would directly ask the population for money. Uh, got that accepted. And then I led the referendum uh, with friends and colleagues uh, strategically as a marketer. And uh, we got 94% of people voting yes to borrowing an extra $200 million um, to fix the schools over seven years. And that happened in a month and a half time. So huge impact. Huge. huge. Yeah. But a very little amount of time. And local. And local. It's... it's yeah, take, giving more than taking. That's it. it. Yeah. Okay. That's wonderful. So, uh, in all of this, um, your uh, what's what's the the bright and shining um, direction or vision that you're taking this? I I love the concept, but is are you seeing other opportunities emerge, or are you still on the front end of this, where where they're popping up and you're you're sure you're doing due diligence maybe. Yes. So, um, I've had eight of them in the last year and a half and wow. that's kept okay. me very, very busy. The latest one is a full-time thing for me, uh, for the last three months. And it's going to end at the end of September. We're organizing a world culture festival as the, the national mall in Washington, uh, where we're going to have 17,000 artists. 500 state leaders, both sides of the aisle in the Congress. Uh, and right now we have given something like 375,000 free passes. So we're going to reach probably half a million by September. Uh, and the idea is to celebrate our differences and to mm. bridge unity and to do it right here, right now, at this time in history, that is a belief initiative for me. What yeah. is a belief? The systems we have come from what we believe in. If I believe that I'm separated from you, if I believe that I'm here to take, I'm here to enrich myself for my family and, you know, let's, let's build a legacy and so on and so forth. We're going to have a very different world than if I believe that you and I are the same, we are one. And so, um, the separation belief has built the kind of capitalism that we have. And I just want to make sure that we don't forget that in the end, we are one. And that belief that we have, that we're separated is not true. Half of us are suffering, 90, 99% of us are suffering greatly from the enrichment of a few. Um, and so this is one of the things that I decided to give my time to. But like moving you. forward after that, I'm going to, I'm looking for more commercial uh, driven uh, these things all came on my lap and so I, I did that, but now I'm looking for, uh, get back in the swing of business a little more and try to add the economic values and, and that's what I'm going to start doing in October. Louis, uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I am so delighted that, that we've had the chance to, um, to hear your story and hear this, this, um, massively cool um, vision for making it better because, um, we need people like you who are making it better. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I invite anyone, uh, who wants to do the same to contact me through regenerative, 
uh, the group because uh, that that is a, the group part is more important than the regenerative part. It happens through us. Yeah, it happens together. Yes, right. It happens. Yeah, it's it's people together working together. I I I deeply appreciate it and I feel like I I don't want to go to this but this is how we end the show so I I'm just going to ask you some random fun questions you don't know these questions but they're just going to hit you so first is are you iPhone or Android iPhone got it um if you had to give up one of these two what would you have to give up first pickleball or yoga that's a tough one sorry pickleball okay um Where's your heart citizenship? Canada or the U.S.? Uh, 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 cheap shot. <laughs> I am both. <laughs> okay, good good answer. I am too. So um, what book has shaped you more than any other in your life? If you could say there's one book that had an outsized influence, what would that be? I don't know. So, I know it's, a, it's an impossible question. I know. Uh, I will say Siddhartha. Got it. All right. Good one. Um, how do your closest family members, kids, uh, everyone in your immediate family define what you actually do? What do they say about you? Uh, he's an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, what was the first question you asked chat GPT? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, what what is the favorite um small purchase like a web app or a phone app or something like that that's like a hundred bucks or less that has has had an outsized benefit in the last little while or is giving you really great ROI? Uh good question. I have a scanning app on my phone that is extraordinary. That scanning app has uh has really hit the spot so many times because it does the recognition of the size of the page. It's super effective. It's like my Google map of, uh, of business interactions. Uh, it's very cheap and been super helpful this morning. Again, that's why I'm saying it. I keep using it. So good. Louis, this has been a, a pure joy. Thank you for the uh, radiant uh, spirit and um, mark you're making on the world. And thank you that uh, you see something bigger than uh, what is and are building that. So I really appreciate you being on the show and uh, and continued success in all of your endeavors. Thank you so, so much. I'm grateful for you giving me the opportunity to share my story. 